Good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan. I was roped into this, not because I have any skill or talent, but because I drew the short straw. <laughs> no, I, I joke. I, I love being able to share my passion about God. Um, so when the pastor asked me, even though I was terrified to stand in front of people, it's getting a little easier. This is my third time now. Uh, I remember telling you guys the first time I, I, I read somewhere that the number one fear about everybody the number, they say the top three fears. The first was public speaking. The next was getting eaten by a shark. And number three was being burned alive. So fortunately, I've gotten through a couple of those stages. Now I'm just terrified I won't do a good job. <laughs> so pray for me. Let's start with prayer. Our dearest, loving Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that we will be blessed by your spirit and by your word. And my biggest prayer is that I don't get in the way of that. I pray in your name. Amen. So this morning what I want to do is I want to start with something a little bit different. What I'd like to do is show you God through my perspective, if you don't mind. This will lend context to the message I've prepared. One of my interests, I'd say, I don't know about passion, but interest is astronomy. And I see God in that more than in many other ways, just simply because of the grandness of it. And I don't know if you guys know much about astronomy, but what I'll do is just run you through a few little small things that amaze me. Are you guys okay with that? So our closest star is our sun, right? And our planet goes around our sun among other planets and other, other stellar bodies. Our sun is about 900,000 miles across as a sphere. It's ginormous, where the Earth is about 8,000 miles across. So 900,000 versus 8,000. So we're quite small. So the problem with astronomy, as soon as we start talking about it, we very quickly lose perspective of size. Right? Can you guys already see that? Like, what does 900,000 miles look like? So what I'm going to do, just for you guys, is make it very, very simple. You see this quarter I have? Let's envision for a moment that this is our star. This is our sun, which we orbit. It gives us light. It gives everything light and life through God. So this is the sun. How far away do you think the Earth is from the sun? 93 million miles. Rick got it. Thank you. <laughs> I see Andrew trying. Okay, so if this is the sun, this is 900,000 miles across. I don't have anything small enough to represent our world. It would be about a fraction of a period on a page, a dot on a page. But it is about, do you guys think I should stop yet? You'd be close. It's right about here. It'd be right about here. And it's a fraction of a period on a page. It is infinitesimally small, right? So you guys are already starting to see how losing size perspective becomes an issue with astronomy. All right, let's take it a step further. Steve, can you help me for a moment? And I, I volunteer my friend Steve because I know he's not afraid to be in front of people. So let's envision for a moment my bottle of water, the cap on my bottle of water, which is the same size as our sun. You guys see this? This is our sun now, the cap right here. The next closest star in our galaxy is going to be this quarter right here. So how far away do you think these are going to go? Steve, would you start walking towards the lobby, please? Now this is the next closest star, not the next closest planet. This is our closest star. Okay, You guys think you should stop? No? Keep walking, Steve. OK, OK, that's enough. That's, I was actually going to have him go all the way to do it, but I'm not going to do it to him. It would be actually be out on the road, out on Davis out there. I'm not going to have him do it just for the sake of example. Steve. <laughs> no, if, if this is a quarter and that's a quarter, they, the, the, the size perspective puts it a couple hundred yards away. Thank you very much. Now, this next one is going to be really a lot of work for Steve. <laughs> so our solar system, which describes our planetary body, including the sun, the earth, and the other planets. Do you guys know the names of all eight planets? Anybody out there? Raise your hand for fun. Oh, nobody knows all the names of them. One of them. Someone over here does. OK, right on. Tyler, I'm glad to see that the education system hasn't failed you. <laughs> so there are eight major planets in our solar system. Mercury is the closest. It's kind of small. Venus, it's about the size of our planet. And then there's the Earth. We're about 93 million miles away from the sun. Those planets are a little bit closer. And they keep going and they're going. And then, and then it's just they get so far away where we finally come to Pluto, which was recently reclassified as a dwarf planet. It's not a planet anymore. They realize it's so small. But we, in 2009, we, la we launched the New Horizons spacecraft to get there to go check it out. And it was traveling 40,000 miles an hour. How long do you guys think it took to get there? Any guesses? Two days? That's a great guess. We're a little bit off, but you're close. It took 12 years to get there, traveling at 40,000 miles an hour. And Pluto is at the very edge of our solar system. 
about 4 billion miles away from the sun on average. So our solar system, if the sun is in the middle and Pluto is on the outer edge, it's roughly about 8 billion miles across, right? It's this little system of bodies that we happen to live on one of these planets, the third rock from the sun, right? So now, let's, let's make this a little more interesting. The solar system is this quarter. This is 8 billion miles across, right? This is our solar system. The next thing we measure in astronomy is the galaxy, which is a collection of stars, and each of those stars have their own bodies. I know it's getting kind of confusing, but please bear with me. Our solar system, this is our solar system. Now, how, how big do you think our galaxy is? which our solar system forms apart. All these stars. A dot. So if this is our solar system right here, and it's part of the, our big galaxy, our galaxy. I'm not talking about the universe. I'm talking about a galaxy now. How big do you think the galaxy is? Should we have Steve walk to the edge of the galaxy, do you think? <laughs> Would that be helpful? I'm not going to make him do that, because our galaxy would be the size of the United States, where our solar system is this quarter right here. Now, galaxy is a big collection, a neighborhood of stars. Remember that. And then there's great distances between galaxies. They're, they're very separate. There's a lot of space in space. Imagine that. So you're starting to see God through my perspective. How do we define God in the grandness and the size of God? And that's one galaxy. Do you guys know how many galaxies we can see? And I'm not saying are there because we don't know. I'm saying we can see. We can see hundreds of billions of galaxies. And each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. And each star, who knows how many bodies are orbiting that star, like we are orbiting our sun. You guys starting to get the picture? Did you see how we can quickly lose perspective, especially when we're measuring things astronomical? It becomes astronomical. We can't, we can't fathom it. So trying to understand our creator God can be difficult in such terms. We can be, kind of become overwhelmed and say, wow, I can't even I can't fathom God. But we can. Amen? To an extent, we can't fully know God. I mean, he's, he's so far above us. But we know him through his word and the things that he teaches us. And we get to see coupling with this great power, this great majesty, the ability to create such a large, a large existence, a large universe for us. Coupled with that is his great love. So you combine these two great principles of his great power and his great love, and you start to get to know God. You understand what I mean here? So to reconcile these two things, the great love of God and that great power and majesty is it's overwhelming. A lot of us were born into our faith. We were born into our church, into our religion. So we, we kind of have more of a concept of it. But sometimes when you step back and you think about it objectively, it's still overwhelming how grand and how big and how great our God is. Amen? So let's keep this in mind in this context as I dive into this two-hour sermon I'm going to give you. I say that to scare people because I know people start looking at their watches right around noon. So this morning, they didn't even get the chance to put it on the screen, which is really cool. It's a surprise to you. What I want to do this morning is dive into one of the most commonly known parables in Scripture, and that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is going to help teach us about God. For those of you who are familiar with this story, I'm hoping you're not thinking, oh, I've already seen this movie. I'm out of here. I'm hoping with you this morning we will mine some deeper truths out of this topic, this story, with your permission, and if you'll dive in with me. Turn with me to Luke 10. Luke 10. Luke is one of my favorite Gospels. Luke was a physician, so he tends to be a bit more detail-oriented than some of the other Gospels. Luke 10. Turn to verse 25. What I'd like to do is we'll, we'll read through it together. And we'll stop, we'll explore it. What we're going to do is put it under a magnifying glass. Hopefully, we can recognize more beauty, and especially in the context that I just gave you. This is a very, very well-known parable, and I don't want us to demiss it, because like, oh, I know that one. It's, 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 it's the basics. It's Christianity 101. I don't want us to put it in that category. I want to look at it with fresh eyes. It's a timeless parable, and I think we should often repeat it to keep it fresh in our minds. It's very, very important because we, we, are, we as humans, we need to be reminded. I'll just put it that way. Luke 10, verse 25. That's where we're going to start. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up 
testing him, speaking of Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's how the story starts. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not of systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds and bringing the greatest good to others in genuine goodness. Right? Is that a good preface? That's the theme of this story that we're going to mine together. This is Christ showing us himself. Remember how I was talking about how difficult it is to kind of comprehend God in, in, in light of, of how, how great and powerful he is? Well, this is God showing us what he's like and what he'd like to, us to be like. So the lawyer stands up and asks this question. And to us, we're like, okay, yeah, keep, keep going. But bear in mind, there's a large crowd of people around Christ. And, and they were just sweet. He asked the question we're all wondering, how do I be saved, Right? Considering your teachings are so at variance with what, what we've been being fed through our religion, what's the answer? And isn't that the cry of most of our hearts? How can I be saved? Thank you, Danielle. I thought that was a good, good place for an amen. We'll get everyone woken up a little bit. So they're sitting there waiting, breathless, like, what's the answer to this question? But there was a, there was a different, there's, there's an additional context to that where they were really trying to trip Jesus up and get, something to, get him to say something that they could use to condemn him. And Jesus was so uh, brilliant and holy, he would not enter into controversy with them. He wasn't going to argue. He stripped the question down, as he often did when they'd try and do this to him. He stripped the question down to the basics and then even gauged the asker very personally. He's like, I'm not going to turn this into a gladiator sport. I'm going I'm to bring this home to you personally. The, the, the priests and the rabbis had taught something very different than Jesus would have been teaching, so they were trying to entangle him by asking this question. They were trying to trip him up, and then they could go tattletale on him to the authorities and get him removed because he was a thorn in their side. So he turns the question back around on the guy who asked the question. In verse 26, he said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? You guys see that if you're reading along with me? Red letter. What is your reading of the law? How do you see it? What did you read in the law? If you guys remember from Scripture in another place, someone came up to Jesus and said, Master, what is the greatest of the commandments? Do you guys remember that? They were thinking he'd refer back to the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments, when God stooped to give man those rules of life. Which, again, is a magnificent story when you think about the size and the power of God. He descended on Mount Sinai, this small mountain, and with all these this clouds and glory and lightning. And they were terrified because... We are fallen beings. We can't be in the presence of God. His very nature is so much grander than ours. Although he wants to be close to us, in that way, they couldn't get very close. They, they just they hit the deck. But he came down there and he gave them that law. And then when this person asked him that question, what's the greatest of the commandments? They thought he'd choose one of those ten as a favorite. And then, of course, they could get him into trouble for neglecting the other nine. But he turned her back around and he said, what, do you, what is it written in the law? What is your reading of it? The Jews, they, still, they, they were accusing Jesus of lightly regarding the law given at Sinai, which is ironic because Jesus is the one who gave the law at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. The Old Testament and the New Testament are inseparably linked. There's a story after Jesus' resurrection, the road to Emmaus, where a couple of disciples, they were walking, going home, very sad because Jesus had just been killed, crucified. And Jesus came up to them, and through their sorrow, they didn't recognize him. And he said, why are you guys so sad? And they said, we really thought he was the one, and now he's gone. And scripture says, then he opened to them the scriptures, all things pertaining to himself. What what scriptures was he talking about? There was no New Testament at that point. He was talking about the Old Testament. He was quoting the Old Testament to them. So don't try and think that the the Old Testament is antiquated. It is not. The law given at Sinai, that was given by Jesus. So it's kind of funny that they're trying to trip him up to describe his own law. So verse 27. So the lawyer answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You guys remember that. Remember I just said that when someone on a separate occasion had asked Jesus, what's the greatest of the commandment? That was his answer. Love the Lord God and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the, said on these two hang all the other laws, right? That those are the two great themes of all God's law. Sometimes the word law conjures up different imagery in our head. Like when I say the law of gravity, do you guys think of that as a cruel law? No, not at all. This is something that's called design law. We are designed to function as we do on a world with gravity and breathe air. That's a law, wouldn't you guys say? That's a law. That's a good law. But for some reason, when God gives us a law, 
We see it as some arbitrary thing imposed upon us by a superior being. So let's get that out of our head when God says law. Like another law God is saying is take good care of your body. I care about you. Take good care of your body. Don't, don't, don't harm your body because I don't want you to die. I want you to be happy, healthy, and whole. But then, again, something's broken in our hearts where we think, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my real dad. You know? We have that attitude. We've got to get away from that. God is saying, no, I'm telling you these things because it's basically the owner's manual. <laughs> So when he says things like, do not commit adultery, fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven, he's not saying, I don't want you to enjoy the marriage relation. He's saying, I want you to protect it. I want your family to be healthy and whole. How many of us have experienced, perhaps been a part of, broken families? It wasn't a good thing, right? So when God says, this is the rule of life, he's not, he's not telling us to do something that will only bring us harm because he enjoys watching us be unpleasant. That's not it at all. It's quite the opposite. I mean, God has the authority to tell us to do whatever he wants. He is our creator. He's our redeemer. He has that, he has that right, but he doesn't exercise that right arbitrary. He could come down out of the sky and point to each one of us and say, I want you only to wear wool, purple, and yellow sweaters all the time. That, to me, would be arbitrary and strange, right? But he, that, he has the authority to do that, but he doesn't do that. Everything he, t he asks of us is reasonable. But... A lot of us don't understand that, and they certainly didn't during this story. So the lawyer himself answered. He said, love God with all your heart, so on, and your neighbor as yourself. In verse 28, and Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live, right? So, so far, there's no, there's no difference at all. He's like, yeah, you got it. You nailed it right on the head. So it, it, it's interesting because Jesus reduced it down again to just very, very simple terms, the simple the reality of our relationship with Jesus and what we must do to be saved. He presented the laws of, of divine unity, and in this lesson he taught that it's not possible to keep one precept and break another, for the same principle runs through all of them. Can you guys see that? God's laws of love, the same principle of love rub, runs through it, the entire tapestry of it. Supreme love to God and impartial, you guys pick up on that, impartial love to man are the principles to be wrought out in our lives as Christians. So when this happened, you can tell by his response, the lawyer, he felt convicted. And the, reason he asked, the, the whole reason he asked Jesus at all proved that he, he did have stirrings in his heart. He's like, I don't feel right with God. Because if he felt like he was fine, why would he ask, right? So he was, he's, he's searching as well. He, so when Jesus answered that, he finds himself a lawbreaker because he knew in his heart, because he had that moment with God, you know, Jesus is looking at him and he says, do this and you'll live. And he's like, I haven't been doing this. But he was, he, was, he was a lawyer. He was a Jewish lawyer. He was an authority on Jewish law and religion. And he didn't even get it. He was convicted under Christ's searching words. The righteousness of the law, which he espoused, he thought he was doing okay, but then Jesus wiped all that away and told him what the real law was, and it touched his heart. So instead of giving in to that conviction and saying, oh, Jesus, help me, I'm, I find myself outside of this, he tries to justify himself. Verse 29, he says, and he even says this in Scripture, he says, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? So not only was he trying to parry conviction, but he was trying to look better in the eyes of the crowd that's around, just by trying to prove, instead of trying to meet Jesus where Jesus asked him to go, he tried to prove, this is very difficult. Uh, no one can know. Who's, who's my neighbor? Let's make this a nebulous topic so I, don't have to, so I don't have to be very definitive on this. So you can see him trying to... Trying to, to uh, Perry conviction there. And it's, there's a special, stronger context when you guys understand the Jewish ritual law and the Jewish law that they were in. See, the, the issue of unclean and clean and, and the sacrifice system, the sacrificial system, that entire system of worship and sacrifice, may, they had made it so burdensome on themselves. They thought that coming in contact with, oh, any number of things, uh, like as a man, you couldn't come in contact with a woman, like you brush up against them, oh, you're unclean now. You couldn't touch this. You couldn't touch that. You couldn't touch people who were not religious or you were considered unclean. So the authorities in religion at that time had really created a very large partition between themselves and everybody else, which is funny because they were the expositors of God's law and his grace and his love, and they created this boundary. Oh, I can't go, I can't go help out. If I, if I go over there, if I touch them, if I'm exposed to that, I will become unclean, and it's so much work to get clean again. I've got to go do this sacrifice. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. So they had turned the system of worship and sacrifice God had created to save us and to teach us his love. They had turned it into this exclusive division that made them all very, very unhappy. 
and separate, separate from one another. So who is my neighbor? Among the Jews, the question of who is my neighbor caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. They were strangers and even enemies. But, there were, but where's the distinction to be made among the Jewish people, their nation, among the different classes of society? Who should the priest or the Levite or the rabbi consider his neighbor? Who's my peer? Notice how it doesn't say, love your peers as yourself. That would be easy. That's easy to identify. That's people with like minds like me, a similar income bracket, similar neighborhood. Those are my peers. But it doesn't say that. So he found himself very, very far from where Christ would have him be. So who is my neighbor? And again, Jesus didn't be, wasn't drawn into controversy. He didn't denounce the bigotry. That was very, very, very clear. Uh, moving on to verse 30. And like Jesus often did, he didn't answer it directly. He answered it with a story. Read along with me. Luke 10, verse 30. And then Jesus answered and said, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, which both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down the same way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And in like manner, a Levite also, when he came to that place, he saw him and he passed by on the other side. So here we have two authorities on religion deliberately leaving a man suffering. Do you guys see the irony here? I'm too busy teaching people about God to help this guy. The Levites, when it says Levites there, just so you understand what their function was, they were ministers in the sanctuary. They helped with the sacrifices. They helped with the cleaning. There was a lot of work involved in that. The priests, however, they actually administered the sacrifice. They were actively involved. Like You'd probably call them more the deacons or the elders or the pastors. But their biggest thing was teaching. Scripture says we are to be a nation of priests. You guys know that? It doesn't mean we're to stand inside the sanctuary with our robes on in that capacity, because that's what people think when they hear priest. But actually, the larger meaning of priest was teacher. They were supposed to be the ones responsible for the spiritual health of the nation and everybody there. So that's what the priest was supposed to do. So both the Levite and the priest passed by, staying as far away as they could. Man, stories are worth a thousand words, aren't they? They can communicate ideas so much better than just, just saying, no, don't do that. So this was no imaginary scene Jesus was talking about. This actually did happen, and then he was referencing it. And I bet you money, the priest and the Levite that did that were in the crowd at the time when Jesus is saying this. Can you imagine that? Because Jesus is God. He knew who his, who his audience was. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side, I bet were in that company. And both the lawyer he was talking to, that priest and Levite, didn't see anything wrong with that at all. Indeed, it was legal to do that. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes there's a difference between legality and morality. But it was legal by Jewish law for them to do what they did. In fact, to do contrary would have been illegal. They couldn't tell if he was dead. Did you know if they, they touched a dead body, they were considered unclean? They had done something wrong. They had to go through the whole purification process. And for... They couldn't tell what race he was. They, is he a Samaritan? Is he a Jebusite? You know all those ites messages it talks about in Scripture? Something ite, something ite, something ite. There was a lot of nations around Israel, and to come in contact with any of them was considered wrong. They became un unclean by that contact with them. So had they got involved, they would have been condemned by their own laws. Not God's law. Not God's law. Their own law. So they didn't see anything wrong with that. So... And Jesus knew this would be the case as he described the story, but he you know, goes through it, and we come out the other end with a greater understanding. So this, uh, this area was obviously infested with robbers. This is, this is exactly what happened. It was very dangerous. But the priest and Levite, they didn't care at all. Let's pause for a moment to talk about what happened next. You guys know the story. It's in the title, right? What happens next? The Good Samaritan. We say the Good Samaritan, which is really cool. So a little bit of background will be very, very helpful. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Now, what I'm, I'm going to go in through and describe this, but I don't want you to get the impression that this is a Jewish problem. This is a human problem. Can I hear an amen? This just happened to be manifesting at this time in that place, but that is what's in the human heart. But they hated the Samaritans because centuries before, the Jewish nation as a whole, all 12 tribes, they kept getting invaded and conquered and dragged away. And then a remnant would come back. And they'd get dragged away again. And the remnant would come back. Well, during one of those, a few of them stayed behind. 
but they ended up intermingling with all the pagans and the heathens around them, and their religion became corrupt. They held that they were still worshiping Jehovah, but so much paganism had creeped into their religion, it was almost unrecognizable. So the Jews said, no, you're not like us. You're, you're not doing what God wants you to do. You are enemies. You are strangers. We don't want any part in you. To the point, if you read Josephus, if the shadow of a Samaritan fell on you, or touched, or, you know, like if you walked into a shadow, you were unclean. So we're talking like grade A, top tier bigotry, right? And again, don't, don't point at the Jews. This is a human problem. There's hatred in all of our hearts. It comes out a little bit differently depending on time and culture. So that gives it more context why this next part is very profound and moving. So the next person to come along is someone from Samaria, a Samaritan, right? Let me read from scripture. It's even better. If I paraphrase, I might miss something. What were we in? Verse 30? Thank you, thank you. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil on him and wine, and he set him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took two denarii, which was a day's wage, uh, each denarii was a day's wage, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. You guys are familiar with the story. Isn't that beautiful? It's interesting because this man, we don't know his name. He was simply the Samaritan. No doubt when he approached the scene, he understood what was going on. And no doubt, there was no doubt in his mind, this was probably a Jew because of where they were. But he didn't stop to take that into account. The race or the, the gender, the, the class, the, the, whatever it may have been. He didn't take any of that account. And I'm sure he well knew if the situation was reversed, the Jew would have just spit on him and kept going. But that didn't stop him. And it's interesting because he was from a despised race by God's people, but yet he still had love, the love of God in his heart that transcended any of that garbage, those divisions that men make. And Jesus is telling this story in commendation of this man. He's saying, this is what religion is. God had, in fact, chosen the, the nation of Israel as his people. They were supposed to be his church, his light to the world, and go out and bless the world, convert the world. But they had so corrupted that religion to make it exclusive and bigoted. We could take it even further, but I think you guys get the point. They had so corrupted it. So Jesus is saying, no, that's not what religion is. That's one of the reasons Jesus came as a man is to show us, because it was so misunderstood. That system of worship and of sacrifice pointing us forward to the cross that he gave in Deuteronomy was perfect when he gave it. It was a great living, I don't want to say parable, a living analog to show us the plan of salvation. Even in the sanctuary, it's very, very interesting. The items in the sanctuary, there was rich, rich, powerful symbolism there. God trying to, God being as great as he is, we already talked about that. Well, speaking of which, my quarter's still down here. Trying to show us in the limited capacity we have, show us himself trying to communicate to us these grand concepts and ideals, and he has to do it in these ways because that's the way we understand it. Does that make sense? So sometimes when we look at the, the ancient Jewish system of worship, it can be confusing and feel strange and foreign, but God designed it to be a representation of the gospel and to show us himself. And there was nothing wrong with it. That's not why it passed away. It met its fulfillment in Jesus because that was pointing forward to Jesus' sacrifice for us. Does that make sense? So it met its fulfillment. It was perfect. It was not his fault that they corrupted it so. Does that make sense? It was so corrupt to the point where Jesus, the one who gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and gave them all those other injunctions and practical advice as far as nation building and, and getting their nation to be strong and, and function properly, they had so corrupted to the point where when he showed up in the, in the flesh as a person, they not only did not recognize him, but they hated him. He would not pay them the respect they felt they were deserved as, as leaders in their country. He loved everybody that they hated. So not only did they not recognize him, but they hated what he was. He was taking away their influence with the people. They, he was taking away their power. So you can see how something can become corrupt. Now, this is not me going on a tirade and saying religion is a bad thing. No, quite the contrary. But we, don't, we are not saved by our religion. We are saved by Jesus Christ. Religions can become corrupt, yes. But God still wants organized religion so we can gather together and be a blessing. We can't be a blessing to the world if we're not organized. Amen? Yeah. 
So I'm not being anti-religion here. I'm just saying they can become corrupt, and our faith and our salvation is not found in religion. It's found in God. So Jesus said, in verse 36, looking back on the lawyer, right in his face, he says, which of these three do you think proved neighbor unto him that fell among the robbers? Do you guys want to answer that? Do you think we described it well enough? Which of these three was a friend to his neighbor? The Samaritan. Absolutely right. And what's interesting is the bigotry and racism was so strong, when the lawyer answers, he won't even take that name on his lips. He says the one who helped him. He doesn't say the Samaritan. And again, don't think I'm picking on them. I'm just, this is showcasing what's in the natural human heart before God has his way in our heart to remake us in his image. So thus Jesus forever answered the question, who is my neighbor? He shows that our neighbor does not mean merely one of our faith or our church. There's no reference to race, color, class. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Amen? Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Isn't that beautiful? The property of God. I'm the property of God. You're the property of God. Everybody's the property of God. Now, it's easy when I describe a story like this to kind of put, it on a, put a label on it, put it in a box, put it on a shelf, because we've heard of this before, and it's so very foreign to us. That culture, that religion, that place, that time is so foreign to us. We're like, look at those people doing that. I can't believe that. That's amazing. We're not like that at all. The human heart hasn't changed in as many years. That was about 2,000 years ago. Do you know the only difference is now? We have smartphones. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. There, there is a large, group, a large group that believe in the concept that all, all humans need is time to evolve, to get better, to become less selfish and less vile and less brutal. We just need time. We just need time. I, I respectfully disagree. There is no power within us that changes us or saves us. There is a power outside of us and beyond us and above us that changes us. And that is beautiful in itself. We could do a whole other sermon on that, right? But how beautiful it is that God only wants that if we want that. We come to God saying, yeah, I recognize I'm vile. I don't want to be vile. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be filled with hate to one level or another. I mean, we all, not all of us experience this level of hatred or bigotry, I hope, but we still have our own favorites, our own personal pet peeves and the things we don't like, people we don't like, perhaps groups of people we don't like, people that make us feel uncomfortable. Then this parable is talking to you then. Now, in your mind, real quick, think of someone you don't like that makes you uncomfortable. It could be a group of people. It could be a person. Don't say it out loud. That's not the homework. Now let's apply it to the situation. And then that, that'll be an acid test to see how your heart's at, where your heart's at. So Jesus settled the question, who is my neighbor? I love it how he just sweeps away all that garbage they had heaped up on God's beautiful law. All that garbage. And, and reduced it to what's important. The Samaritan had obeyed the dictates of a kind and loving heart, and in this had proved himself a doer of the law which is funny because both of those men were expositors of the law. You guys remember where it says in James, be doers of the law, not hearers only. I say that often to my class because we get into very interesting discussions and I have a lot of bright, brilliant minds in there and I'm simply the referee. But it's all very interesting. Oh, it's very interesting. And then, then sometimes we bring up topics in scripture that are a bit obscure. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Oh, it's very interesting. But unless there's a practical taking in of God's word and his spirit, that avails nothing. That's basically a book club then. So it's interesting. But again, that doesn't save you. God's, Jesus Christ saves you and changes you. It's not the discussion of the theory of religion. It's not all the intellectual stuff. It's what goes on in here. This plays a part. Don't misunderstand me. But these men that passed by the wounded man on the road, they were 10 times smarter than me. So smarts isn't necessarily what God's looking for. Can I get an amen? It's issues of the heart. That's true religion. That's true religion. The lawyer's question to Jesus had been, what shall I do? And that resonates with all of us. Obviously, you guys have all felt that question, or you wouldn't be here this morning. 
at some point, we'd all ask the question, what shall I do to be saved? And then we begin our journey searching. And Jesus, recognizing love to God and man as the sum of righteousness, had said, this do and you shall live. Jesus bade the lawyer go and do likewise. Doing and not saying merely is, is expected of the children of God. Amen? Do, did you guys hear that? Doing and not just hearing. 1 John 2, 6. He that says he abides in him, speaking of Christ, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. A living example. The lesson is no less needed in the world today than when it fell from the lips of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Selfishness and cold formality have well nigh extinguished the fire of love and dispelled the graces that should make fragrant the character. Isn't that a beautiful quote? Kind of summarizes what we're going through. I have a lot of quotes in here. If you guys ever want them, I, I can give them to you. But so don't think any of this is original with me. I'm just plagiarizing. Many who profess Christ's name have lost sight of the fact that Christians are to represent Christ. Ooh, listen to this next one. This is a doozy. This is going to knock you down. Unless there is a practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever our profession, we are not Christians. I love when we get down to the very root of religion and God's law. I love it. Now, lest any of you think I'm doing away with the law and saying, no, no, do whatever you want. It's all about God's spirit and you know, blessings from Jesus and all that. No, I don't believe that at all. But I do believe in sweeping away all the rubbish men have heaped on God's law. Because Jesus himself, and that's what I'm repeating to you, he said, what is the law? Keep the law. Love Jesus with all your heart and your, man as your, and your neighbor as yourself. You do that and you can't be lost. So, when we see human beings in distress, whether through affliction or through sin, never should we say, this does not concern me. It was hilarious. Let me show, share an anecdote with you. This week, in preparing for the sermon, The Good Samaritan, I had a moment where the rubber hit the road for me. And let me, let me pause right there and tell you, I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. Not that I've attained or I'm better than you. Like I told you, the only reason I'm up here is I drew the short straw. I'm not smarter than you or better or closer to God than you at all. And let me prove my point. I was, I was listening to uh, other sermons. I was listening to podcasts because uh, I travel all day for work. And right then, uh, I was actually listening to another sermon called The, the, the Good Samaritan. Right, right then, I passed a guy broken down on the side of the road. <laughs> you guys want to know what I did? <laughs> I convinced myself it was of no concern to me. I said, he looks like he's enjoying standing there sweating outside his car. I think he likes it. When I got to the next light, I did a U-turn because God, God punched me straight in the ear. I'm sharing that with you to encourage you. We are like that. We have that in us. It's a fight. It's a fight. As it turns out, he didn't need my help at all, but I still went back. My wife always says, don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to get killed. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but being spent for God is not a bad thing. I just have a little bit more I'm going to share with you. One last thought. Well, one last category of thought. I have to cut it out as I go because I get to talking. I look at the clock and I say, oh my goodness. There's another layer I'm wondering if you guys recognized in this. Did this story remind you of any other story in the Bible or any other reality? Thank you. She said it, Jesus. In the story of the Good Samaritan, we see Jesus. Let me show you. Humanity has been deceived, bruised, and robbed, and ruined by Satan. Following me so far? Okay. And we were, we, we've been bruised, robbed, and ruined by Satan and left to perish. But the Savior had compassion on our helpless condition. Praise God for that. Remember earlier when I was describing the size and the grandeur of God and his power, right? Remember, I told you to keep that in mind as context as we talk about this. That same God, who could have left us to perish, didn't want to. He couldn't stand the thought of it. There's that parable of the 99 and 1, right? The shepherd, who had 100 sheep, noticed there was one missing. Now, me being a business owner myself and somewhat of a pragmatist, I'd say, well, 
that we call that shrinkage in business. When inventory disappears, it's just a simple factor of business. Loss prevention officers, you guys know what I'm talking about? There is a factor in businesses where they just simply factor a certain amount of loss and it's acceptable. It's just on the books as, well, that was loss, that's a write-off. Jesus didn't feel like that at all. So those of you who are parents, imagine you had 100 children and then one was missing. There's no joy for the 99 in you until that last one is recovered. Now, remember when I was describing how big the universe is, right? My personal belief, and I think it's substantiated by Scripture, is there are infinite worlds like ours, unfallen, created members of God's family. I believe that. You, I could be wrong. You could say, hey, John, well, how do you believe that? It's not a salvational issue. When we get to heaven and you talk to Christ, we'll ask him together. Just an FYI, I'll be the guy with the glorious mullet because I can't pull it off now. So when we get to heaven, if you don't recognize me, you know what's going on. But I believe there's this vast universe, and despite all of that, when Satan did to us what he did to us, God couldn't stand the thought of us not being part of the family anymore. So what did he pay for us to get us back? You know how you establish the value of something? What is someone willing to pay for it? So if you ever find yourself feeling undervalued or that you're not worth much, remember what Jesus paid for you. So Satan had wounded us, and Christ came to die for us. He undertook our case. He healed our wounds. He covered us with his robe of righteousness. He opened to us a refuge of safety and made complete provision for us at his own charges. Just like the Samaritan in the story. You guys seeing that? So how many of you have been blessed so far in that we've, 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 we've mined some deeper riches from this story already? Right? I hope so. I really hope so, because when I read it in depth as part of my devotional, it just hit me and it stuck in me. And then when it was actually right about that time when the pastor said, hey, John, would you fill in for me? I didn't even have that panic of what, am I gonna, what topic am I going <laughs> to, because it was so, in my, I was like, I can't believe that. I never saw it like that before. So I hope you guys got that out of it as well. Now let me just close with this. We've seen what God asks of us in this story. Who he wants us to be, how he wants us to be. And when we first come to God, we recognize these things. And it's and then instantly, at least for me, I kind of have some anxieties. I'm like, I need to do that? I am incapable of that. That is not me. Have you guys ever thought that? That's not me. How can I love that person? How can I be like that? I'm, I'm so far away. And then all, instantly in my head, all I see is the void between where God wants me to be and where I am. If you want to see how big that void is, I can have Steve bring that quarter back out to the street. There's this big void. I'm like, oh, man, I am so far away. So I have, to, I have to say this as part of my message this morning. If, that, if, that, if that's your experience, don't be hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Because guess what? God knows that we're very, very, very far from where he wanted us. That's the whole point. So don't be discouraged and be one of those people who's not going to go to the hospital until you're all better. Do you guys get that point? We see what God asks of us and wants for us, and we say, oh my goodness, I cannot do that. And you know what? We are absolutely right. You're right. You're absolutely right. We cannot change ourselves. Scripture says a leopard can't change its spots or an Ethiopian its skin. I guess even in Scripture, it was proverbial how dark the Ethiopians were. We're talking black, black, dark. And so when he says the Ethiopians can't change his skin, you, you get the point. You see what I mean? We can't change ourselves. We absolutely cannot. So the Samaritan may not be the good Samaritan after all. He was simply the man who allowed God to work in him and change him and become that person. Do you think he was faking it until he made it, the Samaritan? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. And honestly, if you're honest with yourself, when we first come to Christ and we see what he asks of us, we try. We try very hard. We try and we fake it until we make it, right? Hoping we'll... And that's okay. That genuinely is okay. That's a fine place to start. But I'm reminded of a story where a young man opened his present on Christmas morning and there was a big 4x4 four four truck in there. You guys remember the Tonka trucks? Yeah? So being born in the 60s as he was, he was not familiar with powered trucks. So he's grabbing this truck and, man, this is hard to push on the carpet. But he's having the time of his life. And his dad finally comes and says, how do you like the truck? He's like, oh, it's great. It's a little stiff. It's kind of hard to push. That's a powered truck. Press the button. <laughs> so for how many, of us, how, how many of us does that represent our experience in our Christianity where we're trying to be good, we're really, really trying to be good, but it's just, we keep falling flat on our face. Anybody else, or is that just me? About 100 people here, and it's just me? I don't know. 
I have a feeling someone's not being totally truthful, but okay, if it's just me, like I said, I'm preaching to myself. The work, the, the, the part we play in our relationship with God is we approach to God and we let God work in us. So don't be discouraged if we are not what God would ask us to be. He knows that. That's why he said, I, I came to save, I came to change, I came to heal. Our part is letting God do that. And I, if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll be a very different person than you are. What's that old saying? I am not the man I want to be, but thank the Lord I'm not the man I was. That's where I'm at. God has made great progress in me, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm not bragging, but I'm not where I want to be yet. It's a journey. So my point is, as, as we see God's standard for us, let's not get discouraged. Let's roll up our sleeves and dive in and praise God that not only does he have the means, but the will to change us. Do you think all that power it took to create the universe, remember me describing that kind of? I mean, we probably already kind of forgot a lot of the details and we lose size perspective, but the power that it took to create that, he can create in you a new heart. And to add, uh, drive that nail in, remember the world isn't improved by your opinion. It's improved by your action. So that great God who created our universe and through scripture is slowly showing us who he is, Let's ask him to use that creative power and turn it towards us and recreate in us his image and a new heart. I'll send you out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for how much you love us. We can't even wrap our heads around that. We can't wrap our heads around your power or your love. But there's enough in Scripture and in nature to show us how much you love us. And we are so very, very grateful for that love. And our response to that love is, yes, Lord, please, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We pray these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.